Good afternoon and welcome to the National Hispanic Council on Aging Food Security during COVID-19 webinar. My name is Christina Pacheco and I am the Director of Resource Development and Policy at the National Hispanic Council on Aging. It's my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the National Hispanic Council on Aging is developing innovative ways to continue engaging, informing, and listening to communities. For 51 years, NACOA has worked to improve the lives of Hispanic older adults, their families, and caregivers. This year is no different. At NACOA, we believe that healthy aging is not only about living longer, but about living better. Therefore, today we are addressing the issue of food security among older adults. Specifically, you will hear about efforts to address food insecurity, solutions to specific or solutions specific to COVID-19, the status of hunger among diverse older adults, and the status of food insecurity in rural America. Today we offer a robust panel of experts to address a myriad of, of issues surrounding food security. Today's speakers include representatives from Justice and Aging, AARP, Meals on Wheels America, and NACOA's Board of Directors. Our format consists of a panel of experts who share their work and insights with us, followed by a facilitated question and answer session at the end of the panel. As we progress through the webinar, please ask your questions in the chat box and we will address them during the question and answer session. This webinar would not be possible without the generous support of our many sponsors. We offer our sincerest gratitude to Pharma, Pfizer Foundation, Lyft, Herbalife Nutrition, Abzi, AARP, and Lilly. Let's get started. It's my pleasure to welcome the President and CEO of the National Hispanic Council on Aging, Dr. Yanira Cruz. She is one of the nation's foremost advocates and spokespersons for diverse older adults and is nationally and internationally recognized for her, for her commitment and leadership in the aging arena. Welcome, Dr. Cruz. Hello, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Welcome to the Food Security During COVID-19 webinar. Uh, we know there's over 200 people on the phone, so thank you all for joining us for this conversation. Um, I also want to express our, our gratitude to our speakers. We're very lucky to have them with us today. They are truly amazing. Uh, panelists, thank you for all you do each day to help older adults age with dignity. Food security is so important for a person's well-being. If we're well-fed, our organs can function properly. I regret to say that in our world, too many people, too many older adults live with food insecurity. I remember hearing the story of an older adult in Los Angeles prior to COVID-19. And she shared with the National Hispanic Council on Aging that um, there were days during the month when she did not have enough to buy food. So she had to eat cat food. That is all she could afford. And unfortunately, you know, this is a reality that gets replicated too many times in different parts of the country. So I think today's conversation is so important. And I'm just so grateful that um, we're taking the time to focus on on the, on this um, you know element of nourishing our body and having the necessary um, food and nutrients for us for our bodies to function properly and to age with dignity. So with that, I want to thank everyone for being here and uh, turn it over to to um, Christina. Thanks, Christina, for for moderating today's session. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, food security is defined as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy lifestyle. Food security is one of several conditions necessary for a population to be healthy and well-nourished. However, in 2018, an estimated one in nine Americans were considered food insecure, meaning that these individuals experienced a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. This equals over three, or 37 million Americans and more than 11 million were children. 
Before starting with the presentations, I would like to share a personal story from an older adult in Washington, D.C. Her experience with food insecurity is born from her struggles of financial hardship. Bertha Roque is an American citizen who naturalized from El Salvador. She immigrated to the United States in 1981 when she was 38 years old. Bertha worked for 27 years in the cleaning and maintenance industry before retiring in 2008 at the age of 65. She continued to work until 2017 to help make ends meet. Today, Berta is 75 years old and lives at Casa Iris, a housing facility for low-income older adults in Washington, D.C. Casa Iris is owned and operated by the National Hispanic Council on Aging. Berta's sole source of income comes from Social Security, and her annual income is $10,800. That's just $900 a month. Berta's monthly budget includes $275 a month, for rent, approximately $250 for food, $150 for medicines, and $150 for car insurance and gas. After those expenses, Bertha is left with only $75 for the entire month to account for her basic necessities and little luxuries, such as getting her hair cut and emergencies. Unfortunately, Bertha's story is just one example of many older adults who are no longer in the workforce, who rely solely on Social Security, live below the poverty line, and experience food insecurity and often hunger. Our first speaker, Kevin Prendeville, is Justice in Aging's Executive Director. He is a nationally recognized expert on Medicare and Medicaid policy and has served as legal counsel on several class action lawsuits protecting low-income seniors' access to public benefits. Today, Mr. Prindeville will address the status of hunger among diverse older adults. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for having me to NCOA, and uh, thank you, Christina, for your moderating today, and especially Dr. Cruz. Thank you for uh, all the work that you do and for, for having us here today for this uh, important webinar. Um, if you could go to uh, start up my slides, um, and maybe just go ahead to the first slide, or the next slide. Um, so, so I'm Kevin Prindle. I'm the Executive Director of Justice and Aging. Um, and at Justice and Aging, we really work to ensure justice for all uh, people as they grow older. And we see this pursuit of justice as linked directly to two other important issues. Those are poverty and equity, and especially racial equity. And all three of these issues are inextricably linked from the topic of today's webinar, uh, which is food security for older adults from the first communities. Um, and all of these issues have been made even more uh, clearly connected and important in light of the COVID crisis that we're living through today. Uh, so next slide. And so I'm gonna start by kind of describing the picture of poverty and, and how that links to issues of food insecurity for older adults, and then more broadly, how that's uh, changing and becoming even more intense and severe in the COVID crisis. And unfortunately, you know, Bertha's story, which I think is really helpful for grounding the conversation today, isn't unique. Uh, across the country, there's 7.2 million uh, older adults who are living in poverty today. This is per the supplemental poverty measure, which is even probably a conservative measure of poverty. There's even a larger number of older adults that are struggling to make ends meet. They have income coming in from Social Security, maybe a pension, uh, maybe they're on SSI. And it doesn't add up. It's not keeping pace with costs of housing and healthcare and food, um, transportation. Um, it's not enough to make ends meet. So we have this uh, significant number that's been growing uh, steadily as our aging population has been growing. Um, and it's, it's a real a cause for concern. So on the next slide, you'll see that while we have these 7.2 million or more seniors living in poverty across the country, um, that this poverty particularly is impacting diverse racial and ethnic communities who um, are most at risk of aging into poverty. Um, as you can see on this slide, um, the blue bar represents uh, the number of people from these communities uh, that are older people living below 100% of the federal poverty level. And then the orange bar is below 200% of the poverty level. 
which people that are living at about 200% of the poverty level, those are the ones that are just barely getting by. Um, so you can see that the, the, um, the, the, the rates of people that are in that situation of, of, of struggling to make ends meet, it's much higher uh, for black and Hispanic older adults um, than for white older adults. And this is true as well um, for uh, other racial and ethnically uh, diverse communities in our country, including Asian older adults um, and Native American and, and other indigenous communities. Um, and this is linked on the next slide, you'll see um, that another community is that particularly at risk of aging into poverty is women. So older women are much more likely to age into poverty than older men. And the, the likelihood of, of aging into poverty increases as women grow older. So you can see on this graph um, that women that are over 80 are you know, twice as likely uh, to be uh, below the federal poverty level as, as, as older men, um, and over 60% of women over age 80 are living below 200% of the federal poverty level, so in that, uh, below that range of, you know, really struggling to, to make ends meet. And when you take, uh, on the next slide, you'll see when you take um, these intersecting identities, you look at older women, and older women of color, you can see how the intersecting identities and, and the experiences they have throughout their life results in the highest risk of, of aging into poverty being among older women of color. And so on this graph, which with the, the data here is a, a little dated, but the trend line continues. Um, you can see that um, black and Hispanic um, and Asian American and, and, and Native American and immigrant older women are much more likely than, than white older women to age into poverty. Um, so on, on the next slide, um, you know, we'll see how the, uh, inner, you know, the, the, the somewhat obvious interplay, I guess, between poverty and economic security and food security. So when people don't have um, a lot of income, a lot of resources, it makes it difficult to meet basic needs. And one of those basic needs is food. And so we can see that um, across the country, uh, at least 9.5 million seniors are threatened by hunger. This number is a couple of years old, um, and we've certainly seen trends both because of the growing aging population and because of the trends in the poverty rates among older adults that this is probably also an undercount. And some of the other presenters today might have more updated numbers about how many seniors um, are threatened by hunger. They're, they're, they're dealing with food insecurity. They're not um, certain where those next meals are gonna be coming from. Um, this is a pre-COVID number. <laughs> so we're about to get into how COVID has even exacerbated uh, this problem and this challenge that we're all called to meet. Um, but we're talking about significant numbers of people who are struggling. And on the next slide, you'll see that as with um, um, uh, as, as with the poverty rates, um, older people of color are more likely to be food insecure than white older adults. So the, the rates of uh, food insecurity among black and Hispanic older adults is more than twice the rate of food insecurity uh, for white older adults. And again, this is a theme that replicates uh, um, also with indigenous communities um, and other uh, communities of color. Um, but I wanted to call out a couple of these specific examples here. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that, um, you know, that, that hunger on its own is, is, is a problem that we uh, need to be solving for. Um, hunger creates a tremendously negative impact in someone's life um, and it has um, cascading impacts. So th this is some great data that was pulled together by uh, some of our presenters today, their organizations, Meals on Wheels of America and AARP Foundation. And, and they did some studies and found that um, hunger in among older adults is correlated with several significant negative health outcomes. Um, so when we fail to address hunger issues, we're also failing to address health disparities. And those health disparities create you know, significant drain on family and community resources. Um, it's, it, it, the hunger creates these other problems that people then need to address, and, and it's, it's, um, it, it costs those families literally in, in money. Um, it costs government programs and where costs get shifted into our healthcare system when we don't address issues on the front end. 
And then most importantly, it's cutting lives short in, in these communities. It's, it's ultimately leading to um, lower lifespan um, in, in diverse communities, um, particularly in Black and, and uh, Latinx communities. Um, so the, the hunger problems here are, 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 are significant um, and have really, um, uh, you know, problematic consequences in the lives of our, of our communities. Uh, on the next slide. Um, the next slide here, I'm asking the question, why? You know, I, I think that um, we're seeing this in the COVID uh, situation too, right? That this question of why are these uh, disparate impacts I just described, why do they exist? And I think that it's important in our, especially in our aging community, uh, to reflect on this um, within this broader moment we're having as a country. And the reality is that systemic racism and xenophobia in our country, and particularly racism against Black and Latinx and Indigenous and immigrant communities in our country, have actively denied those communities access to opportunities to achieve economic security and related food security. Um, and in many ways, systems have promoted wealth and health of white communities to the detriment and to the harm of the health and wealth of Black and Latinx and Indigenous and immigrant communities. Um, and as Black and Latinx and Native people age, the impact of the inequities they face throughout their entire lives compound. Um, so the, 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 the racism and discrimination they've faced uh, throughout their life has this compounding impact that they continue to face as they're older, but the whole lifespan of, of racism now results in these uh, incredibly troubling disparities in health and economic security and, and hunger. I think we need to recognize that because the moment that we're in as a country and um, as we think about reform that we need to make to be sure that we're addressing um, these causes in the, in the near term and meeting immediate need, but also addressing root cause and, and making systemic reform. And, and on the next slide, um, if you move to the next slide, you know, these systemic inequities um, that, that, that I think many of us have, have seen and the work we've done for a long time, they're really being exacerbated by the COVID crisis. You know, COVID is particularly impacting older adults. Uh, in, in California, for example, 80% of deaths related to COVID are among people age 65 and over. And COVID is particularly impacting Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities. I saw one study done today that looked at a, a group of, of 500 um, deaths from COVID and, and uh, over half of those deaths were among Black um, and Latinx and Indigenous communities. So older adults in these communities um, are dying at disproportionately higher rates than older whites. Um, that's saying for, that's, that is true too for younger generations uh, within these diverse communities. Um, and so COVID is, is having this particular impact on the community. Um, and, the, and COVID's having a particular impact on senior hunger rates uh, broadly and also within these communities. You know, the, as, I, as I shared before, the numbers of, of older adults that were struggling with food insecurity were already unacceptably high a few months ago. And now COVID has made the situation much, much worse in both um, the short term and in the long term. Um, in the short term, COVID has left many older adults isolated so, socially. Uh, shelter in place orders have been really necessary. Uh, they've been important to continue uh, to, to continue to stop the spread of COVID, um, but they've also exacerbated these problems we knew that older adults were facing even beforehand, particularly people that are socially isolated. Um, and one of the related problems is you, when you're isolated, you lose connection to nutrition. Um, as people have been asked to stay at home, um, it creates difficulties getting food. Um, they can't get out to the, a restaurant, to a grocery store, to a food bank, to a congregate meal setting that they were relying on. Um, if they were continuing to work because they needed to to make ends meet, that uh, work may have been disrupted. Or if they are going to work, uh, they're doing so in, in ways that might be putting their health at risk. Um, so, you know, this creates problems accessing food. Um, in the short term. And some of our systems have been able to, to change to meet that need. Um, I know that Meals on Wheels that we're gonna hear from is, has been working so incredibly hard 
to expand their services and programs to meet that need. And, and other programs have also done innovative things to meet the need. Um, but we're, we need more. You know, we're hearing of significant reports of increased need uh, from service providers, as much as you know, growth of 50 or 60 percent uh, of, of need for their services um, in, 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 uh, in helping older adults access food. Um, so, and, and it's not just the food, it's also, like I said, the, the connection to isolation. The seniors are, are wondering where their next meal is going to come from, but, but also when they're going to next be interacting uh, with another person. Um, so it's, it's, COVID is just creating, I think, this very intense crisis on top of what was already a pretty significant um, crisis. Um, and then there's also the long-term impacts of COVID. Um, so that we're, we're really concerned that COVID is going to greatly increase senior poverty and food insecurity in older, older people. The public health crisis has created this economic crisis that's going to take a long time to recover from. And the economic crisis is going to hammer state budgets. We're already seeing cuts to programs that help keep seniors fed. Um, and it's also going to drain resources and wealth from families, uh, particularly for people who are close to retirement. Those are some of the people most likely to lose jobs during a recession and least likely to, to have time to return to the workforce and rebuild lost uh, income. Um, so they're going to have less income, fewer assets as they age, and an increased likelihood of aging into poverty and food insecurity. And from past recessions and this one too, we know that the greatest impact there is going to be on Black and Latinx and Indigenous communities uh, because of those systemic inequities. So we've got a significant growing crisis. We also have an opportunity as a country to recognize the harm caused both by COVID as well as by the systemic racism that's existed for, for a long time in our country. Um, and so you're gonna hear from other presenters today about how we can use this opportunity to meet the challenge in front of us. Um, and our presenters are gonna make clear that response has to be significant in scale and significantly larger than what we've taken on in the past. Um, but it's gonna be necessary for all of us to join together to do this to meet the needs of the older people in our communities. So uh, I look forward to hearing from those presenters and thanks for having me today. Thank you, Mr. Prindeville. I want to remind all of our attendees that if you have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the chat box and we will address as many of your questions as possible during our question and answer session. It's a fact that no community in America is immune to hunger, including rural areas. Even though rural areas grow most of our nation's food, Households in rural areas face considerably deeper struggles with hunger than those in metropolitan areas. Older adults living in rural communities are at a disadvantage in terms of available services, resources, and activities. Individuals living in rural communities experience higher rates of social isolation, higher prevalence of chronic diseases, higher disability rates, lower prevalence of healthy behaviors, and have lower access to health professionals to provide the services they need. There are approximately 10 million people aged 65 and older living in rural America today. In fact, one out of every four older adults lives in a small town or other rural area. In 2016, approximately 6.5% or 4 million people living in non-metropolitan counties identified as Hispanic or Latino. Hispanic residents are projected to become the largest rural minority in the United States by 2025. Gaining access to healthy and affordable food can be a challenge for rural residents. Many rural areas lack food retailers and are considered food deserts. Additionally, residents of rural communities, especially low-income residents, face many obstacles. They have limited access to grocery stores, availability of healthy and affordable food, and have substantial travel or have to travel substantial distances and costs to make, make it harder to shop for healthier and nutritional food. Our next speaker is Cindy Padilla. She is the current chairwoman of the National Hispanic Council on Aging's Board of Directors. Ms. Padilla is, the US, is one of the U.S.'s strongest community leaders and advocates, bringing 30 years of government expertise to NACOA. Ms. Padilla has a background in community organization, environmental protection, and volunteer mobilization. For more than two years, Ms. Padilla served as an appointee of President Barack Obama and or as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in Aging in the Administration of Aging, Department of Health and Human Services. 
Ms. Padilla came to her appointment in the Obama administration after a long career in public service in New Mexico. Today, Ms. Padilla will speak about food insecurity in rural America. Welcome, Ms. Padilla. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Christine. I uh, appreciate um, the opportunity to be here, and I want to thank you all for joining us as we discuss this very important issue affecting millions of Americans um, across the country when we talk about food security, food insecurity, and hunger. Again, um, my name is Cindy Padilla, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to serve as the chair of the National Hispanic Council on Aging, and I'm very happy um, to be here today. Um, we have such an outstanding group of presenters. I'm, I'm very humbled uh, to be um, along with them. And I think you all are going to hear um, some repetitive maybe data and, and information. And, and the reason for that is because it's, it's, it's so stark and it's something that we definitely have to work on together. And so thank you all um, for uh, joining us as our, as our panelists. I would also like to thank Dr. Cruz and our team at NACOA um, for putting the uh, webinar together. I mean, it really is important to make sure that we share information. And of course, I would like to thank our sponsors uh, for supporting um, the work of NACOA every day. Next slide, please. So I'd like to begin with, you know, really the definition of, of food security. Um, and so what is food insecurity really? I mean, they have a definition for everything. It, well, it's the disruption of food intake or eating patterns due to lack of resources and access. And we heard um, already a couple of times, you know, I mean, why do we have these lack of resources? I mean, is it it's economic insecurity? It's uh, limited or no access to food sources. We heard about a food desert. What does that mean when we have to travel, you know, perhaps a hundred miles to get to um, the nearest grocery store for fresh produce and, and fruits and vegetables? Transportation um, is a concern if you don't have transportation. Um, our geographic location and social isolation. These are all um, important issues that are, are lead to and lead toward food insecurity. Next slide, please. Food insecurity can affect people living in both urban and rural areas. And today we'll talk about the rural aspects. So what is rural? Well, rural America, and I believe there might be a slide before this. Um, let me go back one. Okay, next slide. Defining, so what is rural? Rural America really defies easy definition. Um, as though one of my former colleagues, um, I recently did some work with uh, an organization, Grant Makers and Aging, on a rural aging initiative. And one of my colleagues really said, she goes, well, when you're rural, you just know it. But rural America is large and diverse, and it includes you know, many frontier counties, farms, small towns, and even some exurbs. In fact, the federal government uses several definitions uh, of rural America. One is used for the census or the, by the Census Bureau, and yet a different uh, definition is used by the Federal Office of Management and Budget. And there are other definitions or a hybrid of the two definitions used by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and other federal departments such as Health, Health and Human Services or EPA. And so there's no wonder when we talk about rural America and we were uh, trying to define it and say, you know, what is and where is rural America? Well, rural America spans across, um, across the country. Rural America is generally poorer than urban areas. It is aging quickly and it is frequently ignored. We heard earlier too that one out of four older adults lives in a rural community and over 65% of all of the counties in the U.S. are considered rural. Is nearly 7 million Americans are living in rural America and are experiencing poverty. And as Kevin said earlier with his data and the numbers, we really think that those numbers um, are older numbers and, and are um, underrepresented. Next slide, please. One thing that healthcare professionals and policymakers do agree on is that good nutrition affects good health. We also know that food insecurity is strongly associated with poor health. 
And we also know that rural and minority populations are dis disproportionately impacted with our children and our older Americans being the most vulnerable. Next slide, please. Additionally, studies show that hunger among older adults has increased by over 40% since 2001. A vast majority of seniors receiving support are often forced to choose between food and prescription drugs. And only half of all eligible older adults are enrolled in food support programs. And our rural residents typically receive lower social security benefits, compounding food insecurity. Next slide, please. I'd like to take a quick minute to highlight other issues facing Latinos living in rural areas. First, we know that our Latino populations are vital to our US agricultural industries. We know Hispanic families have greater risks of poor health due to factors such as poverty, relocation, and documentation status. And we know that fear is a huge and driving factor of food insecurity and other issues facing our Latino families living in rural America and urban America. Next slide, please. Rural America faces many challenges, but I wanted to take at least a moment to talk about our strengths. Rural Americans are deeply committed to family, history, and community. We are proud and independent. We're strong and resourceful. We value our culture and we are innovators. In fact, Rural America is the original incubator for home and community-based services. Next slide, please. In summary, I would just like to say that our, the data shows that rural communities are disproportionately impacted and have a higher risk of food insecurity. Programs and policies are needed at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, and greater collaboration and coordinated is needed between these levels of government and our nonprofit organizations. Yes, we know that there are many overlooked needs, but we also know in rural America, and with our minority populations, there is a quiet strength, a quiet strength that can lift us up and move us forward. And I think as we've been seeing um, just lately with all of the unrest, it is this quiet strength that can move into a stronger strength and actually and will demand, demand changes. So next slide, please. And I'd like to close with this. And um, as we talked and we began, I think, the, uh, the presentation, Kevin, we talked about the issue of justice. Well, Jacques Dio, who served as the Director General of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization for almost two decades, remind us, reminds us that hunger is not an issue of charity. It is an issue of justice. And President Jimmy Carter also said that we know a peaceful world cannot exist one third rich and two thirds hungry. We are here to end hunger and we are here to bring justice. And again, I wanna thank you all for, for joining us today and thank you for our presenters as we talk about the issues of food insecurity and the issues of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Badia. And unfortunately, she will not be able to join us for the question and answer session. So if you have questions specific to her um, and her presentation, please let us know and we will get those answered for you. Food insecurity does not exist in isolation. Low-income families are affected by lack of affordable housing, social isolation, chronic diseases, high medical costs, and low wages. Similarly, older adults that are food insecure are more likely to be in fair or poor health with frequently associated comorbidities including diabetes, depression, hypertension, heart disease, and gingivitis. Food insecure older adults are also more likely to have limitations in activities of daily living. With closures and physical distancing guidelines aimed at limiting the spread of COVID-19 extended across the country, the impact is being felt in communities large and small. The changes taking place affect the lives of nearly everyone in some way, but food insecure people, particularly older adults, face specific challenges, and the number of people who experience food insecurity is only increasing. According to the Meals on Wheels 
America report of hunger in older adults in 2017, nearly 5.5 million adults aged 60 and older were food insecure, meaning they often went hungry because they could not afford food. Our next speaker is Ellie Hollander, President and CEO of Meals on Wheels America. Ms. Hollander leads a nationwide network of thousands of community-based nutrition programs committed to assuring the health, safety, and independence of America's seniors. Her career spans both the for-profit and nonprofit sectors, including serving as the Chief Strategy Officer and EVP of Business Development at Good360, and Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer and Interim Associate Executive Director of Membership at AARP. Today, Ms. Hollander will talk about food insecurity before and during COVID-19. Welcome, Ms. Hollander. Thanks so much, Christina, and hi, everybody. Thanks for listening in today. I don't look nearly as good right now as I do in that picture, so it's a darn good thing you can't see me. But to build off of Kevin and Cindy's remarks, I'm going to provide some insights into food insecurity for the high-risk, high-need population that Meals on Wheels serves both prior to and during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, two slides. One more. Thank you. So to set the table for my part, so to speak, let me provide a little bit of context. Meals on Wheels America, the organization that I lead, represents the network of thousands of senior nutrition programs, small, medium, and large, serving urban, rural, and suburban communities nationwide. And we envision a nation in which all seniors, let me underscore, all seniors have the opportunity to live nourished lives with independence and dignity. And we advance that vision by providing research, advocacy, education, and training, grants, and funding directly to local Meals on Wheels programs, which in turn serve as a lifeline to our nation's most vulnerable older adults. Next slide, please. Meals on Wheels programs provide so much more than just a meal to 2.4 million individuals 60 years and older annually, those who are in the greatest social and economic need. Besides a nutritious meal, our programs also deliver much needed socialization, wellness, and safety checks. Sometimes that means ensuring tripping hazards in their homes are remediated. Sometimes it means ensuring their loving pets get the nutrition they need too. You may not be aware, but the majority of Meals on Wheels programs provide meals in both group settings, like senior centers, and in the home for those less mobile. And not only are the meals tasty, to which Bob Blancato and I can personally attest, but they're tailored to seniors' unique nutritional needs meeting one third of the dietary reference intake and the dietary guidelines specifically designed for seniors. Next slide, please. Prior to COVID-19, senior hunger was already a national epidemic with half of our programs reporting having a waiting list for meals. You heard this statistic already from Kevin. In 2017, 9.5 million seniors were facing the threat of hunger overall, with another study from GAO finding that 83% of low-income food insecure seniors likely needed nutritious meals and weren't getting them. Despite this growing unmet need, federal funding has simply not kept pace. In fact, our programs are providing 20 million fewer meals today than in 2005. Adding to the challenge in filling the gap is the fact that less than 2% of philanthropy is directed towards seniors and or aging. Also, as most of you know, our model is heavily dependent on volunteers, many of whom are aging and on fixed incomes. Again, setting the stage, this was all pre-pandemic. Next slide, please. The implications of these challenges are pervasive and costly as senior hunger and the frequent isolation that accompanies it are detrimental to both mental and physical health, not to mention they add considerable cost to our healthcare system. In fact, those who are food insecure are far more likely to be hospitalized or needing to be prematurely placed in a nursing home or long-term care facility. 
They don't recover nearly as quickly from illness, injury, treatment, and or surgery, and are more likely to be readmitted to hospitals once discharged. The healthcare costs associated with senior malnutrition and falls alone exceed $100 billion annually. And adding loneliness on top of that, the health effects of which are comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, greatly exacerbates the health and well being of an already highly vulnerable segment of the population. And this was all before COVID hit. Next slide, please. Then in March, in response to the pandemic and stay-at-home orders and social distancing guidelines, thousands of nutrition providers nationwide had to mobilize rapidly to meet the surge in demand for millions more meals to not only existing clients, but to an entirely new pipeline of seniors in need. Practically overnight, senior centers and other community dining facilities had to suspend their traditional service and transform into grab and go and drive through sites to enable seniors who were previously able to get to these locations to instead pick up meals to eat at home. For homebound seniors, programs quickly adopted no touch delivery to enable them to still provide a nutritious meal, check in on their clients visually and have a brief conversation all while keeping a safe distance. And they have augmented their modified service model by also connecting by phone regularly to continue to deliver so much more than a meal. Next slide, please. To get a handle on the pandemic's impact on the Meals on Wheels network, we recently conducted a nationwide pulse survey spanning programs of all sizes and geographies. We learned that, not surprisingly, the demand for meals has dramatically increased with eight out of 10 programs reporting that their weekly meal requests have at least doubled. Some programs are seeing requests growing by the thousands. Overall, programs are serving 56% more meals and have added 22% more seniors to their ranks each week since March 1st. Those programs with existing waiting lists before COVID report that those lists have grown by 26%, with 22% saying that their waiting lists have more than doubled. And beyond the need for more funding, programs reported their greatest challenge is access to safety supplies, such as gloves, face masks, hand sanitizer, and cleaning supplies. Next slide, please. The bottom line takeaways from our COVID-19 survey are that Meals on Wheels programs are pulling out all stops to scale to meet the unprecedented surge in need, which by the way, is not waning, but continuing to increase. Without question though, much more funding is needed and not just funding to cover the cost of meals, which have increased exponentially, but also to cover the need to hire more paid drivers, cover increased transportation costs and to source and procure scarce safety equipment and ingredients for things like shelf-stable like shelf meals. While the severity of need varies across geography and program size, the demand is unquestionably universal. Over the past several months, we have all had a taste of what it's like to be homebound and isolated. It's pretty crummy, isn't it? It's important for us to not lose sight of the fact that while many of us prepare to return to our routines, or some variation thereof. Millions of seniors will be left behind, wondering from where their next meal will come, because this is their norm. That's why we need to advocate aggressively for continued funding and support to give them a voice and a fighting chance. Next slide, please. If you're like me, you wanna help. So what can you do? You can advocate. This week, in fact, we're joining with the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations to urge Congress to consider the needs of older adults in the next COVID-19 relief legislation. And you can do so too. It takes less than five minutes to participate. Simply dial 1-855-626-6011 and listen to the recording about COVID-19 and the need to help older Americans. Stay on the line and you'll be automatically connected to the congressional switchboard. Once connected, ask for your senator and advocate for additional emergency funding for vital programs that help keep older Americans safe and healthy 
in the next COVID-19 relief package. We'd appreciate you doing that. The second thing you can do is to contribute, whether by volunteering and or donating by going to www.mealsonwheelsamerica.org slash find meals to locate your local program. The third way to help is to call, email, and or hold driveway conversations with seniors in your neighborhood just to let them know that you're thinking about them and to check in on them. And lastly, if your organization provides nutrition services to seniors, you can join Meals on Wheels America for $300 or less a year and apply for a COVID-19 response fund grant up to $25,000. You can learn more there by visiting www.mealsonwheelsamerica slash membership. Next slide, last slide, please. In closing, see, this is what I look like right now. I want to thank you for your interest in senior hunger and isolation. We have an opportunity to close the gap on the need for nutritious meals and companionship. Doing so is not only socially responsible, but it makes economic sense too. Let's turn this moment in time into a defining moment for the millions of seniors who are counting on us to be there for them. After all, they were there for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hollander. I want to remind all of our attendees that if you have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the chat box and we will address as many of your questions as possible. We've got some excellent questions coming in. According to the U.S. Census Bureau and the National Institute of Aging, estimates um, the current elderly population is set to double by 2050. This means that people are living longer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are living healthier. Our health status is closely related to the aging process, with nutrition playing an important role. Food security refers to the availability of an individual to have access to nutritional and safe food for an active and healthy life. It's important to highlight that increasing food security isn't just about having access to enough food. It's about having information about and access to the foods that give us the opportunity to stay healthy as we age. Our next speaker is Lisa Marsh Ryerson, president of the AARP Foundation, the charitable affiliate of AARP. A bold, disciplined, and collaborative leader, she sets the foundation's strategic direction and steers its efforts to realize an audacious vision, a country free of poverty where no older person feels vulnerable. Since she took the helm, AARP Foundation has implemented pioneering in initiatives explored new avenues for collaboration, and secured unprecedented funding to support programs and services that truly change lives. Today, Ms. R Ms. Marsh Ryerson will speak about food security among older adults. Welcome. Thank you, Christina, and a huge thank you to Yanira and to all of our colleagues at NHCOA. And what a treat to be with all of you. As others have said, I wish that we could be together, but I'm really pleased to be here with you today virtually. Let me just say that Kevin and Cindy and Ellie, you provided such important context and the work you do is so critically important that I will just add a few remarks to those that you've already heard. And you know, in listening to uh, the three previous speakers, I was reminded again powerfully that our shared work in addressing social determinants of health and building a food secure nation do require the collaboration and partnership and commitment to supporting one another's efforts. It, we're all in this um, to get the good work done and I certainly could not, my team at the foundation could not do our work without each and every one of you. You know, as has been noted, um, and I will just repeat, we know that well prior to anyone even hearing the word uh, COVID-19 and entering the pandemic, that there were, you know, millions of older adults who were food insecure, suffering from either daily hunger or long-term access to both nutrition, affordable, nutritious, and culturally appropriate diets and food. And as Kevin, uh, and others have outlined for us, we also know that is, as is true with other social determinants of health, food insecurity disproportionately affects communities of color. And, and we need to come together to address this justice issue, to address systemic inequities and structural racism, as Kevin and Cindy 
and Ellie described. It's, it's very, very important that we get this work done. One of the solutions, of course, is to support robustly and financially um, opportunities that are already working, such as the work of NHCOA, such as Ellie's work and the great work of Meals on Wheels America and Justice in Aging as well. But there are some other things that we can be doing. I wanna point out or, or be redundant and reiterate that uh, food insecurity does affect health in profound ways. And coupled, as Ellie said, with other social determinant issues, whether it's housing or social isolation or insufficient income, the health impacts can be devastating for a growing number of older adults. We have to recognize, and this group certainly does, that food, in fact, is medicine. And while income is significantly linked to three of the 10 chronic diseases, food insecurity is significantly linked with all 10. So adequate nutrition is critical for a healthy immune system, especially critical as we're facing this current pandemic. And we cannot ignore, as we know, the problem. If there is any good news, it's that nutritious diet can prevent or reduce the severity of many diet-related diseases, it not only improves the quality of life for vulnerable older adults, but it does in fact cut healthcare costs as well. So it's of grave concern, as you've heard, that as the pandemic spreads across the nation, food insecurity rates are spreading exponentially as well. The pandemic has made it harder, as you've heard, for low-income older adults to access food. Many cannot afford to stock up on groceries to minimize repeated and risky trips to their local store as public health authorities are advising older adults to remain at home. They may also need help, as we know, getting to and from the grocery store. And that help is not always readily affordable or accessible. And while many of us have purchased our groceries likely on, online during these past several weeks, we have to remember that more than 13 million low-income adults lack broadband or home internet access. People are also facing during the pandemic, the fact that the food costs have risen during this period and dramatically in April alone, the price of food that we eat at home jumped by its largest number in 46 years. When as little as $5 and 20 cents a week in extra food can push a person into food insecurity, rising food prices are really disturbing and troubling. And as people have lost their jobs, as has been shared today during the pandemic and sought more help for food assistance, food assistance organizations are becoming overwhelmed. Physically distancing and these requirements also hurt seniors' ability to obtain food. As has been shared, congregate meal sites have, have sometimes been closed uh, altogether, while others, as Ellie shared, require people to pick up their own food, creating challenges for low-income older adults. It can be so hard for those who are relying on public transportation to get their meals when transportation options do not feel healthy right now, when they're restricted or when they're closed. Older adults who depend upon others to drive them to, for example, senior centers for meals may not always have a driver available. So the pandemic related difficulties in accessing food disproportionately affect low-income seniors and low-income seniors of color who are already most at risk for malnutrition and hunger. Lifting pandemic-related restrictions won't necessarily solve the problems. Next slide. Next slide. I wanted to share with you um, some of the top line results of an AARP Foundation survey that we fielded among older adults during the pandemic so that we would get an understanding of how low-income older adults are experiencing um, the restrictions, but also grocery shopping specifically. So as you'll see, as the restrictions are lifted, many older adults remain worried about the risk of grocery shopping. And this is adults 50 and older, as you see on the slide. The survey of low-income adults found that 69% were somewhat very or extremely concerned about grocery store shopping because of underlying health conditions or the ability to physically distance and maintain that necessary distance while shopping in the store. And others were concerned about their ability to physically distance en route to the grocery store. Next slide. 
AARP Foundation has been working hard to work with other organizations to help food insecure and socially isolated older adults avoid hunger during the pandemic, all the while working on the longer term work to increase food security. And as we began hearing from our collaborating organizations about how overwhelmed they were with what I will call acute food assistance needs, we wanted to be able to jump in with our resources and our connections to help meet the need. So we decided that we would reach out to our program participants, our volunteers, many of whom are also low-income older adults, and our community partners, for example, uh, low-income senior housing partners, as well as some of uh, Meals on Wheels America or Ellie's affiliate organization, and, and you heard Ellie um, remind us of how the wait lists are growing just so dramatically during this period. And we came up with a rapid response program or solution to develop non-perishable food boxes directly to either uh, low-income senior housing partners or to older adults who participate in our program and to our volunteers directly to their door. Each box contains essential food, food items that can be made into about two weeks worth of nutritious meals. But it's important to remember that this has been a very successful program and that we've provided the equivalent of just over 1.4 million meals to 42 states, to Puerto Rico, to the District of Columbia, and we've provided our outreach and assistance both in Spanish and English. So we're proud of our ability to do this, but you know, not all low-income older adults are able to cook on their own. So we're well aware that we're meeting um, partial needs. We'll continue to provide the program over the course of the next several weeks to be sure that we're able to, to do our part uh, to meet growing needs at this time. Next slide. Some of the ways that we're addressing uh, food, growing food security for the growing number of low-income older adults who are struggling uh, have longer-term impact. And, and Kevin's team and the work, Kevin, that you've done in increasing SNAP participation is really important to the work that we're doing as well and it has long-term impact. SNAP, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, becomes really important for low-income older adults. SNAP participation um, reduced the probability of food insecurity. It does reduce it by over 18%. But you know, among older adults, less than 50% who are eligible are participating in SNAP. So we're working very, very hard to encourage and increase support for SNAP applications for low-income older adults. Some of the ways that we're doing that are through grant making, where we're able to help community-based organizations who are already supporting the application uh, process by providing direct assistance and outreach to low-income older adults. And we've also been providing technical assistance for organizations for states specifically who want to uh, gain approval to offer ESAP, or the Elderly Simplified Application Process, for older adults who are low income and who are 60 and older. And through our efforts, we've been able to work with a, a number of states who have gained approval to offer ESAP. And know that if you're interested in hearing about that work, I'm happy to share, share more, but know that our work in providing access to ESAP and SNAP will continue because it really is a proven poverty fighter. Next slide. Before I wrap up, because we wanna be sure that we get to, to questions and you've heard so much more, I wanted to talk a little bit about one program that emerged out of AARP Foundation's Innovation Pipeline. So again, in addition to funding um, organizations who have bodies of work that are proven to increase uh, food security and advancing their solutions, we also are developing new opportunities to increase affordable access to nutritious and culturally appropriate food. So one of our new programs that is really getting some traction is called Healthy Savings. In this program, we designed it to help older adults stretch their existing food dollars while increasing their access to quality, nutritious food. Because studies have shown that the typical older adult diet is low in, for example, whole grains and dairy. And so AARP Foundation's Healthy Savings Program helps and supports and encourages older adults to buy these nutritious foods 
by giving them weekly discounts that can save them up to $200 each month. And this program is available through a digital app or on a healthy savings card. And the discounts are now available at over 22,000 grocers or grocery stores across the nation. And they're bolstering access to nutritious foods. And we know that this improves the quality of the older adults diet over time and contributes to more robust health. So uh, as has been shared today, we have miles to go to make sure that no one in America is food insecure. And the pandemic has provided even greater awareness, acknowledgement of the challenges that we're facing in reaching this goal. But for sure, I'm proud to be on the journey with all of you to call you my colleagues. And I'm confident that together we're going to get there. Thanks for having me and looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Ms. Marsh Ryerson, and thank you to all of our speakers for informing and educating our audience on food security. Now let's begin with the question and answer session. So first, um, for all of our panelists, our first question is, what best practices can you say All right, can our panelists hear me? Our first question is, what best practices can you suggest for public health departments to scale to address food insecurity? Christina, this is Lisa. Yes. Happy to jump in and, and we'll look forward to um, the feedback and views of my colleague panelists. But when I uh, think about scale um, and some of the programs that we've discussed today, you know, among the best practices, before we go to scale, being sure that the evidence does exist, right? That um, the programs or tools or services that we're offering are really increasing food security, whether or not we're using the food security survey or some other tool to, to be sure that we are getting the result um, that we intend to get. And then once there is that body of evidence, I think moving to scale means um, looking for other organizations who can, through funding and collaboration and strategic partnership, can then scale those programs nationwide. Fantastic, thank you. Do any of our other panelists want to add to that? Okay, our next question is, um, can you speak to the gap between food insecurity and nutrition insecurity in seniors during COVID-19? Um, folks may have access to food, but not to healthy food, and that gap has widened during the pandemic. And I know um, we had a speaker address this, but could you maybe expand on it a little bit more? It sounds like our um, audience wants to hear more. Uh, um, here's Ellie. I'll just say that, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, that the, the meals that Meals on Wheels providers provide are very specifically designed to meet certain nutritional standards for seniors. Um, at the same time, the recognition is sometimes we need flexibility in that during the pandemic because it's more important that people get food. And it was has been very difficult in some cases to source certain ingredients that we normally would include, but we've had a little bit more flexibility. Nonetheless, uh, we strive to make sure that we are not causing harm um, for the, highly vulnerable population that we serve. So remember today, we're sort of talking about the entire senior you know, population. When you look at a continuum and you take the far right-hand side of those with multiple chronic conditions who are taking you know, multiple medications, that's generally the, the, the side of the continuum that the Meals on Wheels senior nutrition programs focus on, whether in congregate or whether at home. So I would just say that there has to be a trade-off right now 
between meeting the, the, the high standards of, of nutrition requirements and making sure that people that are hungry are getting food. Nonetheless, as you've heard, waiting lists continue to mount. So clearly, we don't have enough resources to reach all the people in need. Thank you. And Lisa, um, a question came in specifically for you. Can you give an example of what food items are in the shelf-stable food boxes? Yes, I can. Thank you for that question. So, um, you know, these are shelf-stable food items. And as I said, um, it, it, they do require, of course, that those who are receiving the boxes and the meals are able to do their cooking. But, you know, it includes a really important basis basic items such as um, grains and rice and um, using that as a base and then other items such as beans um, to be sure that there are fulsome nutritious options in the meals that are prepared and it's two weeks worth of food. Yeah, th th this is Kevin I, I think he's jumping in here to, to add um, how important it is that we think about this gap. Um, because we're going to be in the situation with the COVID crisis for some time and we're going to have seniors that are isolated um, for some time so we uh, we need to be designing strategies and solutions that really do meet those nutritional demands you know um, I mean, uh, Ellie's you know really in the in the midst of this now but I haven't seen data but just anecdotally hearing about seniors that since they are trying to go out less they're they're buying less fresh food um, they, it, it's, it's a bigger challenge to meet the need with fresh food. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we need to be thinking that way of how, if we're going to be in a situation where older people are staying home more over a long period of time here, that we need to make the investments, um, you know, and, and we look primarily to how we can ensure that governments are investing in uh, older adults and the needs of older adults so that we're really ramping up the resources that are available to meet this expanded need over a long period of time with food um, that, that needs that basic need like Ellie was talking about and that we have a strategy for how to ensure that it's nutritious and fresh and, and leads to good health outcomes. Yeah, I really want to and just underscore, Christina, what Kevin and and Elliot said, because it really, as we know, it's just a combination of steps that needed to need to be taken, right? It's it's good policy, it's it's collective will to understand that longevity is such a great opportunity, but it's not, um, you know, it, it's uneven across this nation. And if you are living in poverty or on the verge of poverty, a longer life will not necessarily be a healthy healthier life. So it's also about funding what does work, as Kevin is saying, and advancing those solutions because so many exist out there in our ecosystem. And then jumping in with new innovations or our emergency food box, which is providing nutritious shelf-stable food um, during this time, but emergency food assistance should not be our long-term goal. Food security for all is the longer-term goal. I completely agree. And can the panelists speak to, I know that there was a call for our participants to advocate for um, COVID-19 relief funding for, to address food security. In the two prior um, packages that were approved, were there any measures to address food security that you are aware of? Uh, I, you know, I know Bob Blancato is on this call and he, he could definitely add to this, but I, I can tell you that Bob's organization and I were very closely together to make sure that there was uh, $750 million of additional funding that could be earmarked toward nutritious meals in the Families First and the CARES uh, relief packages, which really the second and third package. But if Bob can unmute yeah. himself, you may want to add to I just did, Ellie. Thank you for uh, remembering here me, me to be here. Yes, actually, Families First and uh, CARES Act also provided $500 million in increased funding for the WIC program and $950 million increase for the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which deals with food banks, which you know are under tremendous uh, uh, stress and, pr and uh, pressure at the moment. But as I will say in my closing comments, we have a fourth bill coming, and these numbers are dropping the bucket of what we really need.
thank you for sharing that information. Um, another question came in about the map purchasing related to what was being shown in the media. For instance, if there is a shortage in toilet paper, folks ran to the stores and bought up toilet paper. And how is that affecting some of our low-income communities, particularly low-income older adults, when the media speaks to a potential meat shortage um, and now folks are mass purchasing? Um, can, can our panelists speak to that a little bit? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in for, again, for the, the more frail part of our population. Um, many of our programs, when they have increased the number of uh, meals delivered, groceries delivered, you know, the drive-through pickup through these, um, the community congregate sites that I mentioned earlier, uh, they've had to add some um, very important essentials to those deli deliveries because many of the seniors um, or, you know, they, they've been told to shelter at home. They, they're the population that's disproportionately impacted by, by COVID. Um, so many programs needed to and have continued to provide more than just a meal. I didn't talk about you know, toilet paper and hand sanitizers and stuff, but obviously that's, that's a great need. Um, and we, meaning Meals on Wheels, have had our own challenges. I mentioned in the survey we did, the second, uh, most dire need for programs uh, is in that, you know, supplies, um, shelf-stable ingredients and, and safety supplies for sanitation and to protect the seniors, volunteers, and staff uh, who are wanting to ensure that our clients are safe and healthy at home. So it's, um, it's it, there's a cascading impact. And many of, uh, again, Bob and I have been on many a call, even with FEMA, uh, because some of our providers said that many of the orders that our programs had made during the pandemic, immediately, early on, knowing that this was going to be an issue, um, some of that was commandeered by FEMA uh, to make sure that, um, you know, it was stockpiled for other reasons. So it, it's been a challenge. Yeah, this is Lisa. I want to really underscore um, Ellie's comments that and the, the questioner who asked the question, which is that, of course, as there have been supply chain issues and we've all experienced these shortages, we know that um, those gaps will have disparate impact on low income older adults and have that cascading effect. And, and they've caused prices to rise, as I said earlier. And low income older adults or food insecure individuals and families don't have the financial resources, even if they're able to have someone shop for them or access food during this time, they will not have the extra income to stock up in the way that others have stocked up. So I also appreciate that, that Ellie and others have really brought out, and, and Cindy did as well, the connection between isolation and these issues of getting enough supplies. So, you know, when anyone is headed to the grocery store, um, think about connecting with a low income vulnerable senior in your neighborhood and do their shopping for them and then ask them how they're doing and listen to their answer. That is a great idea um, and definitely something that we can all do. Um, another question from our participants is, have any of the panelists worked with the homeless senior population um, and how are they doing during COVID-19? Or Bob, oh, sorry. Yeah. This is Kevin. I, I could jump in here for a minute. I mean, um, so we're not working directly with homeless seniors, but we're talking with a lot of providers who do. And this is certainly a crisis on top of a crisis. This is how they've described it to us because we already had this um, emerging crisis of growing numbers of older adults becoming homeless um, and, and a growing uh, a part of the homeless population being older people. Um, and that that uh, epidemic of uh, homelessness among older folks, again, is uniquely hitting, uh, especially in some of the urban centers, black uh, older people um, are, are people that are being displaced and forced out of secure housing and, and into homelessness. And then the, the pandemic, you know, like we've been talking about, just exacerbates everything. So it's very difficult for homeless older people to 
um, to get access to food, to get access to healthcare, to, to stay socially distanced, to, to wash their hands, to find clean masks. Um, so it's really, um, you know, just another one of these situations where the people that were already uh, most vulnerable in our in our community are, are you know, just in under particular um, attack uh, in this COVID crisis. Uh, we are seeing some uh, areas do, um, you know, rolled out ambitious initiatives to serve homeless uh, communities broadly, including older adults, like uh, rapidly housing um, homeless people into what otherwise would have been vacant hotels and motels. Um, there's been some success with those efforts and we need to start to transition to how we think about these as long-term efforts. I think a lot of programs that were set up in the early response to COVID uh, were set up assuming that these were you know, short-term uh, projects and programs. And I think there's a realization that for our community, the aging community, COVID is not a short-term crisis. I don't think that's true for any community, but particularly for the, the aging community. So we need to start to um, think of these short-term investments and programs that were created as, uh, as, as long-term needs that we're gonna need to meet. Um, so I, I think there's, um, I, we're seeing interest there from, from policymakers. Um, uh, but more, more work to do and more potential that COVID is going to create new types of housing and homelessness problems as the economic impacts of COVID um, take root um, and people as a result have a more difficult time um, paying rent, paying mortgages as federal support that's going out to people to help them make those payments um, potentially stops or as states that and states and localities that have stopped, you know, that have created um, rent freezes, um, you know, as, as if we if we pull back on those things too soon, then we're going to see an, an increase in the numbers of older people and others that are struggling with homelessness. Yeah, I think Kevin, you're really bringing up the important uh, point about how the recovery is not short term, and that in the period of recovery, we really have to think long-term. And I, I so appreciate your words about the intersection of social determinants of health, that you know we're talking about food security today, it, it, but it's related to housing security and income security and um, social connection, access to community resources that help low-income older adults thrive. And I, can I add one more thing to that, just to build on those excellent remarks of my colleagues, is that we are, this is a long haul endeavor. I mean, just stepping back for a minute, food insecurity was an epidemic before COVID. With the pandemic, I think we're going to see millions more seniors who are going to be homebound. Um, yeah. and, if, and if we can't keep them in their own home, they're either going to be on the street or in hospitals or long-term care facilities. So I, I think that there's, we talked about cascading impact. I don't think we have any idea of what is in store for us as we cross this threshold into this, you know, next several months. We talked about, you know, the, the, the statistics say that by 2060, the senior population is gonna double and so on. And we have this wave. I think we are not remotely prepared for what's on this other side, because for millions of seniors, they are not going to be able to, I'm afraid, uh, you know, I, I, let me back up. I think they're gonna be set back. That's and I, yeah, that's a better way of saying it. I think they're gonna be set back. And I think that, that therefore, there are gonna be many more people who are gonna be homeless. And, and, and it's, it's a major concern. And, and I don't know what we do about it at this point, but I think we need to be having this conversation. Yeah, Ellie, you're so right. And I think it goes back to, you know, Kevin, uh, as you started us off, you know, this is the, the wake up call, I hope. I mean, for those of us, uh, those who are on the webinar, our colleagues at NHCOA, I mean, this we know that poverty was on the rise um, for older adults. And we have to go back to what Kevin said. I mean, fundamentally, we have to address systemic inequity and structural racism and the embedded issues in community and approach the work in a holistic manner, uh, building more economic opportunity and more equitable communities. Exactly. I, 
I completely agree. And I think that these conversations need to continue. Um, and before we wrap up, as we are nearing the end of our time together, there is a question um, for AARP, and it says, um, for ESAP, what states is that available in, and what does technical assistance from AARP look like? Yeah, I, I won't take the time now to, to list all the 12 states that we've worked with, um, but, you know, Christina, if you want to, if you know who the, the person is, I can uh, certainly connect them with our team that is offering um, this support. Our technical assistance is helping the states and organizations um, review and work through their application process to gain approval. The other arm of the technical assistance is doing grant making so that organizations have the capacity to increase their outreach to provide direct assistance for older adults who are eligible for ESAP. Perfect, and we do have that um, individual's information and we can Perfect. connect the two of you. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, and if anyone has additional questions for our panelists, I know we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, we will make sure to provide their contact information, um, or you can always reach out to us at um, NHCOA at NHCOA.org, um, and we will help facilitate uh, answering those questions. Before ending, I would like to introduce Robert Bob Blancado. You heard from him a little bit during our question and answer session. Um, and he will be providing closing remarks by highlighting possible solutions to consider at the federal level via legislation or regulation in regard to food security among older adults. Mr. Blancado is a member of our board of directors and he is recognized as a national advocate for older adults and a policy expert. Welcome, Mr. Blancado. Thank you, Christina, very much. And uh, on behalf of the board and Yanira, I want to thank uh, the prestigious presenters on this uh, webinar, yourself and Kevin and Ellie and Lisa. And if you can go to the first slide, if you have the slides there. Clearly, one takeaway that you've heard about today is that increased food insecurity is one of the consequences of this pandemic. Our friends at FRAC captured this dramatically when they said in a report just released on Friday, that in the United States, overall food insecurity is more than two times what it was prior to the onset of this health crisis. And in states with high Hispanic populations like Florida and Illinois, more than 20% of respondents said they sometimes didn't have, did not have enough to eat or often did not have enough to eat. Next slide. So the challenge at hand is to address all three nutrition related crises coming about in this pandemic, hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. As we talked about earlier, the response to date by Congress and the administration has been good in terms of passage of the Families First and the CARES Act. And those numbers I, we gave earlier, but they're up on the screen for you to remember one more time, these programs that got increases. Next slide. But the reality is the demand is still on the rise across this nation, especially in minority communities as jobs continue to be lost and other dire economic consequences come to bear. And the other reality we hear, and Ellie and I in particular hear about this, is for those folks running nutrition programs, whether they're for children or older adults, that first batch of emergency funds could run out as soon as Labor Day, if not before. So therefore, our advocacy focus has to be on the next emergency funding package, which is gonna be considered by the Congress in July, because we don't know how long this pandemic is gonna go. We don't know how many more people are gonna incur food insecurity as a result. But at the very least, we need the next bill to have, next slide. We need significant increases in the minimum benefit in the SNAP program. We need greater and full access to online shopping and more support for enrollment activities that Lisa mentioned in her comments. In the Older Americans Act, at least another $750 million for our Older Americans Act nutrition programs. The WIC and the TFAP program also need much more funding. We need increased funding for the child and adult Care Food Program, the National School Lunch Breakfast Program. The House has passed the bill to that extent, but the Senate has not matched it. They have to do that. And then we need a more concerted effort to repurpose commercial food for household consumption, as they're trying to do now with the Farm to Families Food Box Program. And we should not be throwing away millions of pounds of fresh vegetables when they could be used in our communities across the country. Next slide. So in this time of crisis, it's about mobilizing. 
we must mobilize on behalf of those who are in genuine need. Members of Congress need to know what's going on on the ground. Ellie and I do our work to tell our members of Congress that we work with about what our nutrition providers are saying are happening, but it may mean more about household by household in certain communities to talk about what's going on on the ground. Members need to hear about from people who are providing services, from those who are receiving services, and how important those services are to their day-to-day -day life. So in other words, they need to hear from everyone, and that includes those of you who have taken the time today to listen to this webinar. You need to be part of the mobilization effort. And you've been given some good tips earlier, and I know that we'll continue to do that going forward. And I think we have one more slide that's a resource slide, let's see, yeah. So we'll leave that up. That's some more information if you need more information about some of the topics that we talked about. Um, but again, thank you for uh, participating today. As participants, thank our, our panelists. And uh, thank you very much, Christina. Thank you, Mr. Blancado. Again, thank you on behalf of the National Hispanic Council on Aging to our sponsors, experts, and especially to our attendees for joining us for today's virtual event. We invite you to follow us on our social media platforms. You can find us at, at NHCOA, and we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also visit our blog that's featured on our website at www.nhcoa.org for the latest information about public health issues, including the topics discussed today and for upcoming webinars. A copy of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. Remember, you are not alone and we are all in this together. Thank you and have a wonderful day.